Chapter 1 Humble Beginning You are listening at NovelFull.audio This is where it all began. A junkyard. Oh no, this isn't your clean, mechas. Only junkyard that was the starting point of many mecha geniuses out there. I have seen and heard my share of rags. Riches stories, and many of them claimed that they had started from junkyards and slowly grew to be where they were right now. From zero to hero, they declared. You can do it too, they said. As long as you work hard, everything is possible, they claimed. I call bullshit. Life doesn't work like that. All those professed zero dot two hero geniuses are definitely middle to low income families who still have houses to live in and regular meals three times a day. The junkyard they claim to have started from is definitely just a scrappy second dot hand mecca shop down the street. I can bet everything I own on it. For one thing, they all look too clean to be junkyard scrappers like me. They speak too nicely, their hands are too smooth, and their eyes are shining too brightly, god damn it. Yes, they are all skilled beyond measure. Yes, they all took the world by storm. Yes, their stories inspired billions of young children to work hard. But they definitely didn't start from a mecha junkyard. Because for another thing, it is impossible to get anything of value in a mecha junkyard. Period. All the things they throw into a mecha junkyard have passed through many nimble hands and sharp, discerning eyes from various organizations before finally reaching the junkyard. And everything that reaches the junkyard is well and truly that. Junk. Bits and pieces of mechas that have absolutely no commercial value left. Of course, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So to lowborns like us, a mecha junkyard is still a wonderful place where we can find bits and pieces of metal and wires which we could use to stay alive. Just that, mind you. Stay alive. Dot not to create a mecha out of spare parts that can take the world by storm. The idea of finding something incomparably precious in a junkyard that could somehow change a person's life is absolute nonsense. Truly. It's a myth, born of fantasy, spun into a delicious tale meant to do one thing. Entertain, and entertain only. Me. My turning point came from a real junkyard. And it isn't even a mecha junkyard. It's just a regular junkyard. If junkyards could be graded, then a mecha junkyard would sit very comfortably at the top of the list. Then below that would be an airplane junkyard, an automobile junkyard, a ship junkyard, then right at the bottom would be the regular junkyard and the rubbish dump. The last two didn't really need to be separated, since both were absolutely similar in value. But at least the regular junkyard doesn't smell. And that, my friends, is where I come from and where everything started for me. Because although I had just spent the past few minutes claiming that getting something even remotely useful from a junkyard is a myth meant to entertain bored young people with too much time on their hands, it is very certainly that way for everyone else, it was not the case for me. I was scrounging for useful stuff in that regular junkyard one fine morning. If you're wondering why I was in a regular junkyard instead of a mecha junkyard, it was a Monday. And I spend my Mondays in a regular junkyard just to switch things up a little. I had a great start to the day, I actually found an entire length of wire deep within the junkyard. A full 200 centimeters, still connected to a weird squarish wire head. Feeling encouraged by such bountiful harvest, I began to attack the humongous pile of junk with great fervor. If an almost intact length of wire could be found there, what other treasures would that particular pile of junk yield? But as usual, I found nothing else of worth. Just piles and piles of scrap metal and broken pieces of, junk. Just as I was about to take a deep breath of resignation and leave that pile to move on to the next, I saw a dust-covered curved item hiding beneath some tattered cloth. In fact, I barely caught a glimpse of anything. Most of the item was under that piece of cloth, the only thing that caught my eye was that the item was most likely to be spherical, and it had a relatively smooth surface. Point to note for you aspiring junkyard scrappers out there, if it's spherical and smooth, grab it. More often than not, it's worth something. 
even if it is just a broken piece of what used to be a spherical item, you can at least use it to drink and eat. And grab it I did. To my great joy and surprise, it was an intact spherical item. A full and complete sphere the size of a human fist. My heart almost burst from happiness. Whatever it was, it was still intact, and it might just be reparable. I held the sphere with trembling hands and began to wipe it with the bottom of my, well I would say t.shirt, but it wasn't much of a t.shirt anymore. Let's just say clothing. Yes, I began to wipe it with the bottom of my clothing. And piling joy upon joy, I immediately noticed a series of very familiar runes etched on the sphere. I gasped in shock. I actually recognized the object. It was a mecha core. Holy smokes. Talk about hitting the jackpot. Up till that point, I had never seen a mecha up close before, much less a mecha core. But I had devoured every little bit of information I could get my hands on about mechas, their pilots, their stories, everything. And I knew for certain that I had in my hands an intact mecha core. I remember feeling faint. I couldn't believe it. I collapsed on the ground, closed my eyes and counted to ten. I then did several difficult multiplications in my head. Finding that I could do them smoothly, I took a deep breath and prepared for the final test. I had to do it right. P.A.K. I gave myself a tight slap. Ow! I yelped in pain. It hurt like hell. Damn it! But inside my heart I was trembling with joy. It was not a dream. I had a mecha core in my hand. I turned back to check on the spot where I found the mecha core. I wasn't expecting anything else, but hey it never hurt to be thorough and check. I cleared the space a little, and found that it was the rear end of a car. In the ancient days, they had this compartment at the rear of the car where they could put stuff in it. I lifted the tattered cloth up to check what else was in that compartment and got another big shock. It was a human skeleton. Chapter 2 Experimental Mecha Core You are listening at NovelFull.audio It was unquestionably a human skeleton. Time had left its corrosive mark on it and it was almost unrecognizable. But I could still see the skull, pieces of the spine and the pelvic bone. I grimaced slightly, and started to feel rather nauseous. I was no stranger to death. You couldn't grow up on the streets and not see death at some point. But I was totally unprepared to meet with the remains of a human being so up close and personal. You see, whatever could be said of me at that time, one thing was for sure. I was young. Very young. I don't know my age exactly, I think almost everyone living on the streets are the same, who cares about birthdays, but I was definitely no older than ten. By ten, you were either independent and street smart, or you're dead. I was the former. Very much so, if I may boast a little. Anyway, I digress. I fought down my nausea and bravely searched the trunk for other valuable stuff. Jackpot. A satchel. Could this day get any better? I remember thinking of that ecstatically. I grabbed it and quickly closed the hatch of the compartment once more. I put the mecha core in my pants where it would be safe, and hugged the satchel as I left the pile of junk to look for a safe place to check out my treasure. I peeked out of the pile of junk and checked the surroundings. I was scrounging very early in the morning when I knew that there would be very few people around. But I was a cautious boy. Because well, cautious boys stay alive, and careless boys die. Finding that the coast is clear, I ran down a path that was surrounded by piles and piles of junk that seemed to stretch out infinitely into the horizon. It was one of many paths that Chris. crossed the junkyard. Some lead to dead ends, some lead to exits and entrances, and some lead to the worst places in the junkyards. Gang hideouts. I picked the one I knew that would lead me to an exit near my home and ran as fast as I could. It would be really bad if a gang member caught me running with a treasure such as the satchel I was holding on to. After a heart-poundingly scary few minutes, I finally made it out of the junkyard interior. I slipped past the main, broken, 
gates of the junkyard and darted into a small pathway leading into a small forest just outside the junkyard. After a minute or two of scampering about, I reached the place I humbly call home. It was a double-engine helicopter wreckage. It was a monster helicopter when it was operational, and it was a spacious home now that it was a wreckage. Pathetic as it may sound, living in such a large wreckage was actually a luxury among junkyard scrappers. I was extremely fortunate to have found this large helicopter wreckage. It had everything I needed, which was a roof, and the occasional electricity if I managed to scavenge or rob a power source. Yes, yes. I do rob other junkyard scrappers. I didn't have to, but I did. I am not a kind person. So there. If you don't like it, you can. Go eat candy. I breathed a sigh of relief once I entered my home. I never had a visitor ever since I moved in two years ago, and I wasn't expecting to have one anytime soon. I quickly sat down on what used to be a cockpit and took a deep breath. Save the best for last, I told myself. I nodded sagely and forced myself to open the satchel first. The mecha core can wait. It won't go anywhere. I told myself. I snapped the latch on the satchel open and lifted its cover. My eyes grew wide in wonder as I beheld the treasures within. Jsekpoti. A handheld communicator of some sort greeted my eyes which were shining in excitement. I would definitely be able to get it up and running again. It just needed an electrical boost. Aside from the handheld communicator, there was also a half. Rotted folder filled with rectangular pieces of parchments. The ink on the parchments have long faded away and they were worthless. And then there was the final item. A necklace with a metal plate. I gingerly took it out of the satchel and ran my fingers on the engraving. Dr. Andrew Kennedy Mecha Engineering Central Division The skeleton in the storage compartment of the automobile was a mecha engineer. He must have been murdered and his body dumped there before the automobile was disposed of. I placed the necklace back into the satchel, and hid the satchel in a secret compartment I found in the helicopter. After that, I took out the grand prize that I've been waiting so eagerly to study. The Mecha Core If I somehow managed to play this right, this would be the key to a qualitative change in my life. My ticket to a better future. I wiped the mecha core clean with a piece of cloth and studied it very carefully. It was blood red in color, and semi-translucent. I frowned deeply. I had never seen or heard of a mecha core that was blood red in color. A mecha core is a practical application of a massive technological breakthrough in energy manipulation early in the 22nd century. Surprisingly it was a scientist from a third world country who made the breakthrough, discovering a compound element and a unique method which allows for a controlled nuclear fission triggered by electricity to happen. It was a massive turning point for humanity as energy became a non-issue within one short decade. With unlimited energy at their disposal, the scientists and engineers of the world made breakthroughs in almost every field of study and application. However, it was the undisputed number one power of the world, the United States of all Americas, USA, which weaponized the technology. They developed the technology further, finally culminating into palm-sized energy capsules that produced enough energy to power massive robots that packed a ton of firepower. The second-ranked power of the world, the European Empire, soon followed suit. Within a decade, the other powers of the world had developed their own oversized robots powered by similar applications of the technology. The age of mechas had begun. Almost every mecha core was electric blue. The rare and more powerful ones were white. The rarest of them all were golden. There was no such thing as a red mecha core. I gently caressed the mecha core with my fingers as I contemplated the issue. That it was a mecha core, was undeniable. The runes etched on it were definitely the ones in almost every single mecha core I had seen in the documentaries. However, it was also undeniable that red mecha cores were non-dot-existent. How could they exist? Only three compound elements were found to be suitable to be used in mechas, and they were blue, white and golden in color. 
could this be a fourth element? But why was it in the junkyard in the body of a murdered scientist? Wait. Could this be an experimental mecha core that failed? Ouch. I yelled out in shock. A sharp pain coming from my fingers jolted me out of my reverie. I looked at my thumb in great surprise as it began to bleed profusely. I quickly sucked on it to stop the bleeding. But before I could do anything else, the mecha core in my hands cracked, and then exploded. I stared at it in horror as it transformed into a wave of red energy and pierced into my tummy. An overwhelming deluge of pain assailed my senses, and I passed out. Chapter 3 Devour You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. I woke up with a sudden dotness that was astounding to say the least. There was no sense of lethargy, nor was there a need to reorient myself. I became conscious and my brain whirred back to full speed as though it had never blacked out. I opened my eyes and noticed that the sky was already bright. It was noon. But at that moment, I couldn't care less. I remembered the wave of red energy that pierced my tummy and instinctively braced for pain. But thankfully, and rather surprisingly, none came. Weird, but definitely good. After a second or two, I looked down and lifted my clothing up to check on my tummy. There was no trace of anything entering it. Dot no wounds, no scars, no dried blood, nothing. I touched it gingerly, and upon feeling no pain once more, I got slightly bolder and pressed on it lightly. Nothing. I frowned slightly, and pressed down on my tummy with more strength. Still nothing. Everything felt normal. That's really good, but the weird part was starting to bug me. Was it a dream? My eyes swiveled to the secret compartment where I kept the satchel. I sprang up with great agility and quickly opened it up. There it was. The satchel was still there. I breathed a sigh of relief. That's really good. It was still weird, but at least the good parts were still there. It was not a dream. The red mecha core was real. And it was within my body. I was a ten-year-old junkyard scrapper. I've had my share of wounds and bleeding. Some were trophies from accidents which made me stronger instead of killing me, and some were inflicted by other junkyard scrappers as we fought for, well, scraps. And all my experiences by that point had taught me one thing. If you're not in pain, you're probably fine. So in proper junkyard scrapper fashion, even after confirming that I did indeed have a weird wave of red energy entering my body, I was still calm and collected. I sat down quietly, trying to sense the energy within my body. There it is. I thought in surprise. I didn't expect to detect it so quickly. It was still in my tummy area, where it had made its entrance earlier. I felt my adrenaline pumping really hard in response and to my continued surprise, the adrenaline began to mix with the red energy. My heart began to pound wildly in excitement as I felt the adrenaline-infused energy start to circulate around my body. One round. Two rounds. Three rounds. As it circulated around my body, the energy grew smaller and smaller until it became a quarter its original size. Thereafter, it stopped in my heart and disappeared. Weird, why? Gah! Blinding pain suddenly engulfed my entire body. It was so painful that my nerves had no idea what sort of pain it was. Was it hot? Cold? I didn't know what sort of pain I was feeling, only that it was pure agony. I crumpled onto the floor and began to convulse uncontrollably. The pain continued unabated for many long minutes, but by then I had already lost control of my body. I could only lie down there on the cold metal floor of my home in an awkward position, enduring waves and waves of never-ending pain. Finally, the pain stopped. Gah! I gasped in relief. The sudden disappearance of such incredible pain was like heaven to me. I straightened my body and stretched. Ah, pure bliss. Bliss. I still remember to this day how wonderful it felt. Truly the greatest pleasure can only be enjoyed in light of the greatest pain. 
I am no philosopher, but I know that statement to be true. I had never experienced such pain again, and I am extremely thankful for it. But because of that, I also had never experienced such bliss again. And to an extent, I am kind of regretful. But not regretful enough to want to go through that hell once more, thank you very much. I took deep breaths and examined my body. My body was no longer as it was before. Before the blinding waves of pain, I had a scrawny 10-year-old body, 140 centimeters tall and weighing barely 30 kilograms. After the blinding waves of pain, I was still a 10-year-old, but my body had changed. I was definitely at least 160 centimeters tall. And judging by the muscles on my arms that seemed to be chiseled out of marble, I was probably around 60 kilograms. You would think that I would be shocked to the core. I was shocked, yes, but only slightly. I was still basking in the relief and bliss of the absence of pain, and couldn't spare much shock to deal with the change in my body. Plus at that point, everything was already so weird that having my body suddenly grow a couple of years on me was not that big of an issue for me. Plus apparently, it was a great two years worth of growth. Good. I smiled dreamily as I put down my right arm after checking out the solidity of the muscles with my left hand. I felt really full of power. My cells were brimming with energy, and I had half a thought to go hunting for a few gang members to rob once I was done with enjoying the blissful feeling which had yet to dissipate. I was stretching out my hands flat against the cool metallic floor of the helicopter wreckage when I felt a strange resonance. I could clearly visualize every single detail of the helicopter wreckage, and I felt a deep sense of connection to it. A physical connection of some sort. But there was more, I could also feel a weird mental resonance coming from the control panel of the helicopter. I felt like I could reach out and just, take them. How do I? Crack. A deafening crack sounded, and to my utmost shock. Yes I was truly shocked at that time, blissful feelings be damned. To my utmost shock, the helicopter wreckage which had protected me from the snow, rain, wind and sun for the past two years, suddenly just, poofed. Burst into grey particles and surged into my body. A stream of white energy also entered my brain from the direction of the control panel. I was beyond shocked. Chapter 4 Amelia Dragonos You are listening at NovelFull.audio Bam! My butt hit the ground as the helicopter wreckage disappeared completely. The odds and ends which I had gathered throughout the two years were scattered everywhere around me. I stared absently at my surroundings, my eyes took in everything there was to note about the situation, but my brain wasn't having any of that. Cue up, it told the information that my eyes were transmitting to it sternly. I'm currently overloaded. And so the information waited patiently somewhere in the holding area of my brain. Because, overloaded it truly was. A deluge of information had exploded within my brain, everything pertaining to the helicopter wreckage. Detailed blueprints on how to build and modify it, images of every single component and their names and their functions and how they relate to other components suddenly appeared in my mind. And not only that, the computer program that was controlling the entire helicopter was also there. In my brain. I suddenly knew every line of code needed to write the software to control the Chinook. Oh yes, I finally knew what model the helicopter was. It was called the Chinook. ZH.47J, a 25th generation Chinook stationed in Japan. What a beauty it was. But the true beauty, I realized, was the computer program that ran it. It was called the Advanced Avionics Architecture System, AAAS. It was connected directly to the pilot's neural network, allowing him, her to fly the helicopter simply by thinking about it. It was very, very cool. It reminded me of my younger days when my dad was still around. He was the one who taught me how to read and write. He had instilled in me a great love for reading and learning, and up till the moment we were betrayed by his closest friend and he was killed right before my eyes, reading and learning was all I did. My dad was a military man, and all he had at home were military books. There were no fairy tales or even adult fiction. 
literally every single book was military in nature. Tactics, strategies, analysis of hardware and software, history, political science, technology etc. I didn't care. I devoured them all hungrily. And so although I was a junkyard scrapper, and a successful one at that, I wasn't totally without capital to succeed in life. I had in my mind a wealth of knowledge about the military. Knowledge which I had intended to fully utilize for one single glorious purpose. Revenge. Oh yes, now you know why I did what I did a few years back. But the details of that story will come later. All you need to know that my thirst for vengeance is sated, for now. Anyway, I knew everything about the helicopter. In mind that blowingly intimate detail. Heck, at that moment, I felt sure that I could make one if I just had access to the materials I needed. And thinking of that made me feel rather strange. I could make the Chinook if I had the materials. Definitely. But I felt like I could do, more than that. I felt like I could make the Chinook. Period. I thought of the Chinook wreckage which disappeared into a haze of gray particles and entered my body. Could it be that I can, make the Chinook? By force of will alone, perhaps. Because I was just thinking of, taking, the helicopter wreckage when suddenly, I actually did take them. Make a Chinook. I commanded my body firmly while pointing at the ground in front of me. Nothing. Damn it, why? Make a Chinook. I commanded my body again. Still nothing. Damn. Make a Chinook. Nothing. Make a Chinook. Make a mini Chinook. Make anything with helicopter blades damn it. I shouted angrily out loud, feeling slightly disappointed. At that, my body began to respond. Metal plates grew out of my flesh at frightening speed. Within seconds, I was fully encased with metal armor, from my head to my toe. And a four-dot-bladed helicopter rotor grew out of my back. I took a sharp breath and my heart pounded wildly once more in shock. I did it. It actually worked. I made a mecha out of nothing. I screamed in elation. Well, technically not nothing, but you get what I mean. I tried controlling the rotor. It responded exactly just how my arms would respond to my brain. I didn't even have to think much about it, I just did. I adjusted the rotor so it was placed above me, supported by little pillars that were connected to my shoulder armor. I placed the tail rotor on my back like a shark's fin. Then gingerly, I started the rotors and voila, we have lift off. Holy smokes. Holy smokes. What just happened? I remember feeling ecstatic and surprised and confused and afraid and a bunch of other major human emotions all piled into one. Remember your first times. First time you tried the roller coaster, first time you went to school, first time you had chocolate, first time you skipped school, first time you kissed, first time you had, well. All those first times, add them up together and multiply it by ten. You'll be somewhere within the vicinity of what I was feeling then. It was incredible. And you can imagine my frustration when that first time was cut extremely short. Ding. Life forms detected. Approaching at high speed. A robotic voice sounded from the overhead display. Damn it, the gangs must have detected something. Retract. Come back. I cried. Immediately, my mecha armor disappeared. Bam. My feet hit the ground just as the first members of the gang burst through the trees with their handheld weapons leveled at me. Within a few seconds, twenty Red Dragon gang members surrounded me. A beautiful woman with red hair and dressed in striking red leather walked out of the group. Amelia Dragonos. Leader of the Red Dragon gang. My heart dropped to the pits. She was extremely notorious for being vicious. Precious few people could kill at the drop of a hat. Amelia could kill even before the hat was touched. Well, well. What do we have here? She demurred at me coyly as she noticed my handsome features. 
She ignored me for a moment as she began to study the area. After a few short moments, she looked at me in confusion and asked, Where's the helicopter wreckage? And where's Justin? Are you his, elder brother? Father. I stared dumbly at her for a moment. I could feel my world crumbling around me. So my home wasn't as hidden as I thought. People actually knew that I lived here. Amelia Dragonos knew I lived here. Apparently she noticed my shocked look and wasn't too happy about it because she immediately snapped at her underlings, capture him and bring him back to base. Bag everything in the area and look for clues. She glared at me as her men moved to secure my hands and feet with various gadgets. You better have a satisfactory answer for me regarding what just happened in this area. If not, your limbs will be amputated and you will live the rest of your life as my toy. She turned around and stomped off. And that was it. My first meeting with Amelia. Chapter 5 I'll start with you guys. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. I do not remember much about the trip back to the Red Dragon base. Although I was beaten up early on, it took everything I had to stop myself from grinning widely like an idiot. I can't wait to actually steal all the mechas that Amelia had. I was cuffed, gagged, blindfolded and dumped unceremoniously into a vehicle of some sort. I could smell other people near me and the distinct acrid smell of the tobacco that I had smelled earlier on the gang members who had handled me so roughly. I sat up and bowed my head, trying to remain as inconspicuous as possible. Apparently I failed miserably. Stinkin' b asterisk 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 d. Snarled a gang member as he landed a kick on my stomach. Oof. I grunted in shock. I did not see that coming. Dot literally. And figuratively. You ruined my day off. A asterisk 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 e. He landed another vicious kick on my body. Enough. A soft voice commanded. The fact that I was left alone for the rest of the trip bore testimony to the clout that the owner of the voice wielded in this particular squad. I took a note of that voice and bookmarked it somewhere in my brain. Thereafter, I spent a relatively peaceful few minutes in the vehicle. Peaceful, and incredibly exciting. The resonance I felt with the helicopter wreckage was back, and it was back at full force. I could sense with extreme clarity the number of vehicles in the convoy as well as other sophisticated machines within them. Three armored transport vehicles including the one I am in and a high-dot-grade transforming automobile that could turn into a mecha. I also knew for certain that if I but willed it, these four vehicles would immediately turn into particles and be absorbed completely by me. I could easily turn into the mecha and make good my escape. But I didn't, because well, I was a smart boy. Okay fine, a greedy boy. I knew there would be more machinery and mechas in the Red Dragon base and I certainly was not going to miss the chance to enter the base and get close to all those delicious food. Sorry Amelia. If you're reading this, that was me. The first of many, if I might add. But I'm not that sorry because you deserved it. You're not a very nice lady at your tender age of 50 now, and you certainly were not any better when you were 35. Although, I have to add that out of the people I've stolen multiple times from, you certainly were the most generous. And this first incident was a fine example of your generosity. It truly set the path for my rise to glory. I immediately knew the second we entered the Red Dragon base because I could feel a powerful surge of resonance that was unlike anything I've felt before. It was so strong and it drew my interest and desire so much that it felt like hunger pangs. It was the presence of a powerful mecha somewhere beneath me. I shivered slightly as I beheld it in my mind. At a hundred meters tall, it would dwarf everything in the vicinity if it ever left its storage area. But its size was not the reason for sparking the strong desire within me. The main reason was its mecha core. Oh yes, that mecha core. It was a beautiful white mecha core. So rare and so valuable. 
Amelia must have either robbed a universe-grade trader to get the money to buy one from the black market, or robbed a dying white mecha pilot that crash-landed nearby. The other alternative was to rob a military convoy, and as impressive as it was, the Red Dragon Gang was merely that, a junkyard gang. There was no way it could go against a military convoy with a white mecha in it. It would be like an ant trying to rob a Labrador. No bloody way. Under normal circumstances, it was almost impossible to see a white mecha on this side of the world. But there it was. And it was incredible. It's really difficult to explain just how incredible a white mecha is. I guess I have to start at the beginning. You see, after USAA weaponized the technology that revolutionized everything, the age of mechas dawned upon humanity. Human-controlled mechas quickly dominated the battles that took place. Nothing could beat the firepower and flexibility that human beings could produce with coordinated attacks made by squads, platoons, companies, or even battalions of mechas. It was the perfect weapons platform. Where previously, hundreds of men were needed to maintain and operate a weapons platform capable of leveling a small town such as a battlecruiser, now just a single pilot in a mecha could do it. A pair of mechas could lay waste to an entire tank company. If manned by capable pilots, flight-capable ones could even go head-to-head -head with a squadron of the Air Force's best fighters. Imagine a thousand such mechas marching towards you. You may be surrounded by hundreds of thousands of other men with sophisticated technology such as tanks, artillery, and even the Air Force. Trust me, you'd still be shaking in your boots. And because of that, within a century, the armies of the world were almost exclusively mecha. At first, the trend was to build human dot sized mechas that packed a tremendous punch. They were extremely flexible and agile, and the militaries of the world loved them. However, these human dot sized mechas were quickly overpowered by larger ones who were able to install stronger weapon systems and deliver more punch. Soon, the trend went back to creating large, oversized mechas to complement the shortcomings of the smaller mechas. These large oversized mechas were installed with ridiculous amounts of firepower. They became so powerful that they were classified as nuclear grade and were subject to the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, NPT. Only the biggest powers could own them. And so, what began as a ballroom dance of mecha innovation devolved into a couple dance between the USAA and the European Empire. They banned the development, production and deployment of mechas above a certain grade which was determined by the core of the mecha. Only the two superpowers were allowed to develop, produce and deploy gold mechas. The rest of the world would only be allowed to build the blue mechas. For a select few allies of the two superpowers, they were allowed to build the higher dot grade white mechas, and only in very limited amounts. These white mechas were a symbol of penultimate power. And not only were they powerful symbols, they also had something that made them extremely powerful and special, unique powers that were not found in the blue mechas. White mechas are able to trigger their cores and release a minor nuclear explosion, one that would be strong enough to obliterate everything in a square kilometer. Excluding themselves, of course. They were built to resist that minor explosion. Now you understand why I was so ecstatic in finding a white mecha in Amelia's base. Upon consuming it, I would gain the power equal to any nation in the world not called USAA and the European Empire. I studied the white mecha with my senses for a few seconds more and somehow I knew that I wouldn't be able to eat it in one go. It was way too big and way too powerful. Interesting, I thought to myself. I still had no idea how my devouring ability worked, and I was very eager to find out. But I guess that white mecha could wait. Because, to my great delight, I could sense a few blue mechas in the vicinity too. 10, to be exact. I'll start with you guys. I thought happily to myself. Chapter 6 Emperor Justin You are listening at NovelFull.audio Get in there, freaking lowlife. The gang member with the acrid breath shoved me roughly. I stumbled in surprise at the sudden push forward, and fell really hard, flat on my face. Bam! 
EMPH. Then. Bang. I could hear a metal door slam close nearby and the clicking of a lock being put in place. Dut, you can lay there and rot today. No food for all of you. You can thank this blasted newcomer for ruining my day off. Roared the gang member. A few seconds later, another bang. Sounded, and I knew that he had left the building. Or room. But probably a building. I knew I was probably in some sort of a prison. The bad news was, I was still blindfolded, gagged and cuffed. Plus the room really stank big time. The good news was, I could sense that the blue mechas were within range. I could absorb them any old time I want. I grinned widely. Or tried to anyway. Those gang members really knew how to gag a man. They had the piece of cloth tied so tight around my mouth that I was sure that if I hadn't somehow absorbed the red mecha core and greatly enhanced my body, my mouth would have been torn. The other good news was I could sense that I could easily break through those cuffs around my hands. I knew with startling clarity that the metal cuffs were made of simple iron and the energy within me could somehow corrode and weaken it. Apparently, I had developed some sort of affinity with metals. I might probably be the happiest prisoner the world had ever seen at that moment. It was an incredible feeling, knowing that you're about to rob the douchebags who had beaten you up and threatened you with painful bodily harm. And not just rob, but rob them totally blind. All I needed to do was to break out of the cuffs, wait until night time, and give the Red Dragon base a quick tour before running away. Heck, better yet, don't run away and simply obliterate the base. But I was hesitant. I didn't want to simply rip apart solid metal cuffs in front of many people. I had to find out if there was anybody nearby first. EMPH. I tried to shout. Emph. Emph. Other muffled sounds rang out from everywhere around me. Other prisoners. Very soon, after EMPH.ing for a few more times, the other prisoners went silent again. What was the point? Nobody knew what the other person was emph.ing about. It was a hopeless situation for them. I waited for a few minutes, making sure that there were no other sounds apart from the ones from the other prisoners near me. And then I took a deep breath and began to pull my hands apart. I could feel my hands grow slightly hot as I instinctively circulated and directed the unique energy I felt previously around my hands. Slowly, I could feel the energy affecting the metal cuffs around my hands. That's it. I exclaimed internally. Destroy the cuffs. Destroy the cuffs. I chanted internally in my mind. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but my desire was clear, and the energy somehow responded to it. After almost a full minute of exertion, I could feel my hands finally draw further apart. And then. Giaic. Crack. The metal cuffs around my hands creaked mightily before giving way. My hands were free. I quickly ungagged myself, removed my blindfold and checked my surroundings. It was exactly what I had envisioned. I was in a cell with metal bars all around me. There were three more cells to my left and right, and four more opposite us, making it an eight-dot cell prison. With four to a cell, they could at most contain 32 people. And right now, every cell except mine, which was empty except for me, was fully occupied. Not a big base at all, I realized. Maybe not even a base, by all external appearances. A hideout perhaps. But it definitely packed the power of a large base. With a white mecha, ten blue mechas and a transforming mecha, it could deal with all the armies any country could send their way. A secret base then. This Amelia Dragonos is a much more important person than I realized. She'd probably throw a princess tantrum once I rob her of everything here, I mused. The Red Dragon Gang is definitely just a front for another big organization. The questions to ask would be, which organization, and what are they doing here, in the junkyard of all places? Are they looking for something? I thought to myself for a moment before my eyes finally widened in shock as everything clicked. 
Oh my god. They're looking for the red mecha core. I realized as a cold, sinking feeling rushed through my body. That's why they sent such a high-ranking person with a white mecha to the area. I need to make sure they don't discover the fact that the red mecha core has been absorbed by me. I need to rob them quickly and eska. I stopped mid-thought as another realization hit me. They would probably know its function. And they would instantly know what was happening the second they see the deconstructed mecha particles rushing towards the prison area. That, Justin's brother-slash-father, had absorbed the red mecha core and triggered its use. I closed my eyes and tried to calmly analyze the situation. My mind whirred at high speed as I thought through various ideas and strategies. After a few minutes, my breathing calmed down as an idea presented itself to me. Yes, this could work. I murmured. Definitely. I'll do that, then. I smiled and gave myself an imaginary pat on the back. Well done, Sir Justin. You've just out did yourself once more. I laid down on my back and tried to make myself comfortable. I would move out as soon as it got dark. I spent a comfortable day just laying there, relaxing and thinking of what I could do next, and deciding what I really wanted out of life now that I had the key to success. A great warrior, maybe the greatest general the world had ever seen. That probably went without saying. A life of great comfort and luxury. Of course. A family. Definitely. A harem. Ah. Uh. I had heard the other older boys talk about girls sometimes at that point, and they had a lot of fun hooting and laughing about all the things they did with them. But to tell you the truth, I wasn't really interested. Yet. I'll make that decision later, I decided. Topic shelved. Helping the world become a better place. Noble and worthy of pursuit. That as well. Definitely. How do I do that? A general would have the power to make the world a better place, but he wouldn't have the freedom to do so. I have the power to do whatever I want. Now, I need to fight for the freedom to use that power however and whenever I want. And for that, I needed to be. My lips curled into a wide smile. Yes, it was at that very moment when I decided that I wanted to be. An emperor. The path before me was set. Emperor Justin. Yes, that had a very nice ring to it. In fact, it still does, even now. Chapter 7 Phase 3 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. When darkness finally fell upon the land, it came very suddenly. One minute it was late afternoon, and then with startling alacrity, it grew darker and darker and then before I knew it, it was dark. I opened my eyes and smiled. It's time to put the first phase of my plan into action. Prison Break With a thought, metal particles surfaced from my skin and quickly formed metal armor over my clothes. With a whoosh, I was in a mecha bodysuit. With that bodysuit, destroying locks and chains became as easy as slicing loaves of bread with a sharp knife. I quickly went around the prison cells and freed the prisoners. There were all enemies of the Red Dragon Gang who still had value. As such, most were civilians, traders, landowners, and the sort, those with a lot of assets and money. And so, being mere civilians and coupled with the extreme state of weakness they were in, they were sufficiently cowed by my ferocious-looking mecha and obeyed my instructions very quietly. I am organizing a prison break. If you go out now, you'll probably get caught again, or worse, you might die. But if you don't do that, you'll definitely die here in captivity. The Red Dragon Gang does not have a habit of releasing prisoners. Plus, you don't have a choice anyway. You have one minute to get out of here before I start shooting. Go. I rasped in a robotic voice and pointed my machine gun at them. I wasn't proud of my actions that night. Out of 28 prisoners, 20 died. Seven were captured once more and after the whole thing was over, were probably tortured to their deaths. The last one, was Emma. After 27 of them scampered away, 
I turned to the final person who still sat there, unmoving and staring at me quietly. It was a little girl, maybe seven, eight years old. She was small for her age, and ridiculously thin. She was obviously malnourished. Even so, she had an extremely obstinate look about her, a determination and strength of will that shone through her physical weakness. I sighed, there was no way I could force her to go out. I wouldn't, and I probably couldn't anyway. I had to save her and bring her with me. Let me stay with you. She said softly, her eyes showed stubbornness, but at the same time, they were also full of fear. Fear that I would force her out, and worse, fear that I would shoot her right there and then. When I nodded lightly in agreement, relief flooded her eyes and her stiff shoulders sagged a little bit as all the tension left her. That relief quickly turned to surprise as my mecha bodysuit suddenly shimmered and a large backpack appeared behind me. A hatch opened and revealed a small place where she could sit. I even made a seat belt for her. Justin, you sure are a thoughtful person. I thought Riley. Get in, I'll bring you with me. I said as I lowered my body so she could access the backpack. Emma clambered in and quickly fastened her seatbelt. That backpack was actually just an extension of my back armor, so there was nothing separating it and my body. Dot, th thank you. Emma said from behind me. Don't thank me yet. We still have to get out of this base alive. I said cynically. Propa papa pat. Gunfire erupted from somewhere in the base. Screams and shouts of surprise could be heard. It's beginning. I said softly. I closed my eyes and reached out to the blue mechas with my senses. I had to do it fast. I released the red energy within me and it shot out towards the blue mechas in a straight line, passing by layers of brick, mud, steel and concrete in the process. Absorb. I commanded once I had a firm grip on a blue mecha. Poof. The mecha turned into gray and white particles and began to make its way back to me. Amid the darkness and chaos that was raining outside, nobody noticed the gray and white stream of delicious particles rushing towards the prison. Whoosh. An amazingly pleasant feeling filled my body and mind as the stream of metal particles and information hit me. I could feel my body responding by growing slightly as it gorged on high-quality metal and a wonderfully delicious blue mecha core. I closed my eyes and my eyelids began to flutter rapidly as extremely large amounts of information began to fill my mind. It is quite difficult to explain how I felt in that very first time I absorbed the complete knowledge and technical understanding of how a blue mecha worked. I remember being absolutely astounded by the endless deluge of information that just kept on appearing in my mind one after another. The blue mecha was close to the pinnacle of human technology, and the software that powered it was humongous and complicated as hell. Millions of man-hours were used to design and program the software to be what it was then. And that humongous set of information only took my brain a short five minutes to store and process. Every single second, I gained knowledge equivalent to the theoretical and practical understanding needed to build the latest generation land jet from ground up. The physics, mathematics, ergonomics, engineering. Everything. It was such an out dot of dot this dot world experience that it became a spiritual experience of sorts for me. To me it became proof that God exists. The brain was God's product and it had no problems digesting the best and most complicated software that man could ever dream of building. None at all. It was like an ocean absorbing a swimming pool. Every drop of information simply entered my brain and nestled somewhere, ready to be utilized at will. I opened my eyes after five minutes. By then, the prison break was in full swing. There were a few fighters in the group, and by the sounds that I could hear, those fighters had somehow managed to get a few guns for themselves. Intense gunfire could be heard. Time to execute phase two of my plan. I turned around and stealthily created a hole in the rear of the prison where I knew there were no machines of any sort in that direction. I left the prison quietly and quickly distanced myself from it. Once I was far enough, I took a deep breath and began to unleash the blue mecha. Ah yes, 
I remember that first time. It was a wonderful feeling. My excitement was palpable and so was my nervousness. Although everything happened extremely quickly, two seconds at most, I could still remember the feeling as though it just happened this morning. I could clearly feel the potential of a powerful form that I could unleash at will. I could practically see it. All its tiny components, its energy pathways and weapons it had at its disposal. Everything was in my mind, and I felt their potential infinitely clearly within my body. And when I willed that blue mecha to take form around me, my body simply reacted. Just like breathing out, the blue mecha materialized around me as the helicopter armor dematerialized. The blue mecha was humanoid in shape and a full 20 meters tall. The cockpit I found myself in was very sleek and minimalist, and as before, I was able to control the blue mecha with my thoughts. But because it was a much more advanced piece of machinery compared to the Chinook, it was actually much more difficult to control. Still, for some reason, I was able to do it with relative ease. I didn't really question the why behind my capabilities back then, I was just happy I was able to control the blue mecha easily. Phase 2 Absorb a blue mecha was complete. Time to start phase 3. Why yee yee? I raised my hand cannon at the largest and fanciest building in that base, a three story building with all sorts of communication towers on the top. Hum. Boom. A ray of blue energy shot out from my hand cannon and hit the building, creating a massive hole in the middle. Chapter 8 Emma, you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Die Red Dragon Dogs. I roared out with glee. My blue mecha amplified my sound hundreds of times over, causing it to resound gloriously throughout the entire Red Dragon base. Wee Wee eo. The sirens began to blare and the chaos immediately intensified as every single Red Dragon gang member mobilized and tried to get to their stations with great urgency. I fired a few rockets into the base to increase the chaos. Boom. Boom. The thing about emergencies is that they completely reveal the competence and the cohesion of a group. And judging by the absolute absence of out dot of dot control pandemonium in the Red Dragon base at that moment even with my rocket barrage and a collapsed main building, my speculations were confirmed. That the Red Dragon gang was no street gang which struck gold and somehow managed to grow big. It was definitely part of a much larger, far better trained group of people. Yes, the base was in a mess, with almost every single person running around and shouting into their communication devices. But there was great order in the chaos. There was not a single person running around aimlessly, not a single cry of fear, nor for as far as I can see, a single misstep in what looked like a standard emergency response to a sudden attack. Within moments, the first fighting elements of the Red Dragon gang had separated themselves from the crowd and tried to surround me. Three blue mechas and a dozen other smaller vehicles. One mecha with the vehicles up front approaching quickly, and the other two mechas trying to flank me. Very impressive. I quickly found out their strength and locations through the resonance that I felt with their machines. My eyes narrowed in concentration and my heart began to pound. The key moment had arrived. I released my red energy and had them shoot out towards the blue mechas and the vehicles. Within a quick second, I had all of them firmly in my mind. With a single thought, I disabled a key component in the mechas in front of me and to my right. Boom. Boom. The sounds of two heavy objects impacting the ground came almost simultaneously. I aimed my grenade launcher in the area in front of me and fired three smoke grenades. And then I promptly turned around and began to dash madly for the forest just beyond the base. Behind me, I could sense the final blue mecha immediately dashing after me in pursuit. The vehicles from the main group began to accelerate as well, but they were destined to fail. Track or no track, no vehicle can keep up with the speed of a blue mecha. Crash. Crash. I smashed into the tree line and plowed onwards. I had not gone for more than a few seconds before loud crashes sounded behind me, 
indicating that the other blue mecha had joined me in the forest. I grinned. My plan was going rather smoothly. With my absolute control over my mecha, I was sure that no other mecha of the same grade can ever beat me in a one-on-one -on -one fight. And I was itching to put that confidence to the test. But my rationality fought down that itch savagely. It wasn't time to engage in fun comparisons. That could happen later. The most important thing at that moment was to make sure that the Red Dragon Gang did not suspect me of having the Red Mecha Core. I spun and fired a few quick shots at the Blue Mecha with my energy weapon. Dot pew. Pew. Boom. Two misses and a hit. However, the Blue Mecha pilot was pretty lucky. He had raised his shield up as he crashed into the forest to protect himself, and had maintained that position since. My shot was actually blocked by his shield. Damn the mecha pilot really had dog shit luck. But no matter, I didn't want to destroy him there. I needed to be further away from the red dragon base. I spun around once more and began to go deeper into the forest. The blue mecha kept himself hot on my heels and occasionally fired a shot or two at me. However, unbeknownst to him, he had fallen completely into my trap. I actually had him dancing on the palm of my hand. First, I had disabled his communication and tracking device, so he was actually fully cut off from the rest of the gang. Yes, I was breaking through a new road in the forest, and they probably wouldn't have any problems locating us. But at least they wouldn't be actively discussing and coordinating evil strategies to take me down. Second, I had weakened his power roots, so every single weapon and movement module in his mecha was underpowered. It was pitiful, really. Amelia Dragonos was probably from one of the richest families in the world, but she certainly had the worst mecha pilots. I had weakened his mecha from the very beginning, and he didn't even notice. A few moments later, the blue mecha pilot that was chasing after me began to slow down as he finally noticed that there was something seriously wrong with his mecha. I slowed down as well, and maintained the distance between us at a comfortable 15 meters apart. Base, base. This is Falcon 2. This is Falcon 2. Do you copy? Hello. Base. This is Falcon 2 requesting backup at my location. I could hear his panicked voice trying to talk to base. Too late brother. I grinned happily. I had just decided that we were far enough from the main base, and that it would be a great time to absorb this second mecha. I spun once more, drew my mecha sword and charged at the blue mecha. Base. Base. I am engaging the enemy. Requesting backup immediately. I could hear him scream into his comms even as he prepared his shield to block my attack. TSK TSK. People should really understand this. The best defense is offense. The only correct response in dealing with an attack from someone with similar strength as you is to counterattack, and counterattack with far more ferocity and savagery as the attacker. Going on defense is definitely the wrong move. Bam. My sword hit his shield with startling power, much more power than a normal blue mecha could possess. Of course. I had the blue mecha core and a red mecha core in me. His mecha fell down unceremoniously onto his knees, unable to withstand the pressure I was exerting. Bam. Bam. I struck the mecha again and again, and after less than a minute, the mecha was completely destroyed. I quickly absorbed the mecha core and turned around to run deeper into the forest. However, at that moment, a soft voice rang out from behind me. You should kill the pilot. Emma said. Chapter 9 Come Get Me You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. I was stunned. More than stunned actually. I was actually horrified and felt rather sorry for her. A cute little girl advising me to kill a fully grown adult in a completely helpless and unthreatening position. Damn, what sort of life had this little girl lived for her to be so heartless and decisive at such a tender age? He knows about your fighting abilities. Or the lack of it. Soon, he would know the general direction of your escape. 
kill him to shut him up. Emma said softly. Damn it. She was right. I hesitated for a moment before making the decision to do as she advised. I pointed my weapon at the pilot who was partially visible after I had smashed open his chest armor to reveal the cockpit. I gritted my teeth and fired three quick shots. Bam. 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 Hello adulthood. I was a junkyard scrapper, and at the age of ten, I already had a string of crimes under my belt. Assault, robbery, and well, murder. That mecha pilot was not the first person I had killed. But he was definitely the most helpless. I hated killing him. It made me feel, evil. But I hated leaving loose ends that could potentially lead to my demise even more. So I did it. Damn you Emma. You made me lose the final bit of innocence I had. Poor me. If you're reading this Emma. Damn you. And also please forgive me for. That other incident. I truly didn't mean to do what I did. Come back to me. You know where to find me. Anyway, after I killed the pilot, I turned around and sprinted deeper into the forest. Phase 3. Destroy a pursuing blue mecha and let the remains be found, was complete. This was to keep Amelia from thinking about the possibility that I had somehow escaped using the power of the red mecha core, while at the same time, allowing me to get some loot. I had taken away the blue mecha core, but that was understandable. The winners of mecha battles almost always looted the losers if possible. Mecha cores are extremely valuable and are worth more than half of the entire mecha itself. Only a fool would leave a mecha core unlooted. A fool, or a very rich person. A stupid rich person, at that, because well, what's the harm of getting a valuable blue mecha core even if you're filthy, stinking rich? After getting away from the immediate vicinity of the battle, I immediately started phase 4. Create pandemonium. I veered and began to run parallel to a large river that was flowing downstream towards Lake Andrews 20 miles down away. Dot Lake Andrews was the sub, headquarters of the National Armed Forces. Making it look as though I was escaping full speed towards it would only serve to complicate the situation for Amelia. Although she was more than powerful enough to take on the entire base with her white mecha, doing that would only serve to derail her primary mission objective, which was to find the Red Mecha Corps. There was no way that the country would allow a foreign white mecha to operate within its boundaries. They would definitely begin operations to surround and limit the movements of the white mecha and the red dragon gang, as well as create a ruckus in the international community which would definitely see the involvement of the USAA and the European Empire. It would be a complete gobblesmack for Amelia and her primary mission. No, she would not do anything to the sub, headquarters. In fact, she would be worrying that somehow her secret mission was leaked, and she would try to stay as far away from the National Armed Forces as possible. That would be the best way forward for Amelia. But not for me. For me to be able to get my hands on the white mecha, I would need to do more than just complicate things for Amelia. I needed to hand her a wonderful disaster that would force her to bring out the white mecha into the open and let the whole world know that she has won in that little red dragon base of hers. And then when I finally steal it, she would have a thousand organizations to suspect. Plus, the other organizations and countries would not believe that a white mecha core would simply disappear into thin air anyway, and she would be hounded mercilessly to publicly bring the white mecha, which she didn't have anymore, out of the country. I grinned when I thought of my excellent plan. Amelia would be pissed big time. That's what you get for threatening me. After running at full speed towards Lake Andrews for around five minutes, I finally exited the forest and reached the perimeter of the National Armed Forces Lake Andrews sub, headquarters. There was a mile of empty land between me and their base. A killing field. Unidentified Mecca. Halt your advance immediately, or we will open fire. I repeat, halt your advance immediately, or we will open fire. A loud voice blared out of the large outdoor megaspeaker. Wait. Don't shoot. I am Falcon 2 from the Red Dragon Gang. 
I'm just here to say hello, and to deliver a message. There was silence for a moment before a stern voice rang out of their mega speakers. What message do you have for us that couldn't be sent by the usual line of communication? Oh the message I have is rather unique. Here, let me deliver it now. I fired my energy weapon which I had charged for five full minutes as I was running towards the base. Get out of this area. Red Dragon Gang is now officially occupying Lake Andrews. I hollered as I released several rockets into the base before turning around and running away. Pew. Boom. An electric blue ray of energy shot towards the base, smashed into their front gate and kept going until it hit a solid-looking building and created a massive dent on it. prata ta 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 Boom. 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 The anti-dot rocket machine gun immediately destroyed my rockets, creating wonderfully scary blasts which was what I was aiming for. Open fire. The stern-sounding voice roared. Pew. 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 Prata tata 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 Boom. Boom. Energy weapons of their own, heavy machine gun fire and old-fashioned cannons began to rain down on me. But they were a hair too late. I had exploded and ran away with all my strength after I had released my rockets, and the one second head start which I got was enough. I crashed back into the tree line, disappeared from their sight and cursed them one last time to make sure that they came after me. Come get me, you incompetent retards. I hollered loudly. Chapter 10 The Whole World Stops End You are listening at Novel Full Audio. I smashed through the trees and made a beeline towards the Red Dragon base. After a few minutes of running, I finally found what I was looking for. A clearing. I immediately launched my helicopter blades and took to the skies. I kept low, just slightly above the tree line and flew off to the south, away from both the military and the Red Dragon gang. It was a master stroke for me. It truly was. The military would definitely follow my trail and when they found that it was suddenly cut off with no viable explanation on how it happened, they would get very alarmed. Not only did the Red Dragon gang provoke them, it appeared that they have some sort of a secret too. They would raise the priority of obliterating this Red Dragon base to the highest. A confrontation of epic proportions was no longer avoidable. They had to get to the bottom of if at all costs. If they couldn't, they would call for backup and make sure the backup could. Phase 4. Create Pandemonium. Complete. It's time for Phase 5. Absorb the White Mecha. And for that, I needed the confrontation to happen first. I needed to find a place where I could observe the battle, and somehow still be far enough from being detected by the two belligerents of the mini.war that was about to begin. Very soon, I saw the edge of the forest. I found a small clearing nearby where I could land and quickly landed. Whoosh! The mecha suit disappeared into my body. I turned around and looked at Emma, who had a calm and rather cold look on her face. Hey! I said. Emma stared at me for a moment before replying with a, hey, of her own. Who are you? I asked. Emma Whitefrost. She replied. I blinked a few times. Trying to remember where exactly I've heard of the family name Whitefrost before. Ah. Uh, daughter of a rich businessman. I ventured a guess. Emma shook her head. Famous politician. She shook her head once more. Famous general. I asked, randomly throwing out important roles in the government. Of course, I was well and truly surprised when she finally nodded her head. General Whitefrost. I frowned. General Whitefrost. I shouted as I finally remembered why that name sounded so familiar. Yes. Emma replied. Ex-General Whitefrost of the Chinese Federation. Not daughter, though. Granddaughter, I stared at her in absolute surprise. No wonder she asked me to kill that pilot. General Whitefrost was a ferocious soldier. 
he rose from the lowest rank of a mere private to become the most feared general of the Chinese Federation. During the Third World War near the end of the 22nd century, he led the Chinese army to victory from one insane battle to the next, going against all odds and defeating every army sent his way until he was finally captured by the combined might of nations that would eventually be USAA and the European Empire. And even then, his capture was merely due to the fact that he had run out of ammunition. 50,000 men against almost a million men. And he only lost because he ran out of bullets. His capture was the only reason why the Chinese Federation was not a superpower at that point in time. The Chinese Federation had so much riding on him that after he was captured, it only took the other countries five weeks to end the war. If you're not a student of history, it is kind of difficult to explain the notoriety of General Whitefrost. You might think he was merely another captured great general of an enemy country. Yes, he was all that. But he was more than that. His tactics and strategies were incredibly beautiful. So beautiful and groundbreaking that they caused the rewriting of countless military textbooks. His applications of the ancient 36 stratagems of Sun Tsai were absolute works of art and deserved to be included into the modern rendition of that famed military book as glowing examples of how creativity and ancient strategy could lead to incredible results. And not only was he a great strategist, he was also a famed Mecca pilot as well. His white Mecca held the record at that time of 1,753 kills. Of course, I broke that record rather easily early on in my career. But during the time of the Third World War, 1,753 Meccas was a large number. He was impressive. Very, very impressive. He was the general of that generation. I had delved so deep into my new life as a junkyard scrapper that the memories of my life before my father died seemed so very far away. It was actually quite incredible that I forgot who General Whitefrost was, considering that he was my idol. Maybe it was a defensive mechanism that my mind took instinctively to protect me from the pain of remembering too much. I read countless books about General Whitefrost in my father's library a long time ago. He was my one and only idol. The person I wanted to be when I grew up. Before my father was murdered before my eyes, of course, and that dream disappeared like the morning mist before the afternoon sun. And before me was the granddaughter of that man. What could I do? I gulped and gave her a weak smile. How? How's your grandfather? I asked carefully. Looking for me, I presume. Worried sick. Killing people left and right. Emma shrugged, talking about her grandpa killing people as though he was merely out going shopping. Oh. I said stupidly. And gulped once more. What is that? Emma asked as she pointed at my chest curiously. I glanced down and saw that my chest was glowing red. Oh this. This is some sort of a mecha core, it's pretty mysterious, I don't really know how it works, I explained. Yeah. Of course you don't. You just broke out of a heavily armed base, baited a military base full of soldiers to come after you, all based on some mysterious mecha core which you have no idea how to operate. Emma nodded sarcastically in understanding. I blinked at her in surprise. Truly the granddaughter of a military demon. I remember thinking. Yeah. Be more sarcastic to the person who just saved you and holds your life in his hands. Good going, keep it up, little girl. She wasn't the only one who knew how to be sarcastic. Based on what you did earlier, you can break down mechas from a distance at will. You can absorb them and turn into them. And I am guessing that it's all because of that red mecha core. Emma said quietly and ignored my sarcastic reply. You just got your hands on a unique and very powerful experimental mecha core. Emma, that little demoness, was very, very smart. Well, of course she was, considering that she wasn't born of natural means. But I had no idea then, and I was very suitably impressed by that eight-year-old who had just displayed the observational and thinking skills of a sixteen-year-old. Or a ten-year-old junkyard scrapper like me. 
junkyard scrappers are, after all, forced to grow up much, much faster than normal kids. In a survival race between a 10-year-old junkyard scrapper and a 16-year-old kid from a wealthy family, I'd gladly put all my money on the 10-year-old junkyard scrapper. Every cent. Any time, every time. But I digress. Back to the story. All right, fine. You're right. I conceded. I can do all that. Happy. I must have sounded much rougher and angrier than I thought, because at my words, Emma fell silent. Her body quivered lightly in what I assumed was fear. I sighed. First she got all sarcastic on me, then she became all fearful and started trembling. What on earth do I do with her? After a moment, her trembling stopped as she regained control of her body. But look. I can do this too. I summoned a mecha armor over my arms and gave them little helicopter blades. I switched them on and directed them at Emma which blew at her powerfully. You can turn them into portable fans. That's really useful. Especially during summer. Emma smiled at me. I stared at her, mesmerized. I still remember that moment as though it was only yesterday. It was the first time I saw her smile, and by God she was beautiful. When she smiled, it truly felt like time the whole world stopped and stared at her for a while.